Welcome to the Pioneers Lecture Series, where we dig deep into the ideas changing your world. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a team of researchers called the R3T have been hard at work to rapidly understand the novel coronavirus using their science. We invited members of the R3T to talk about the ways they're helping humanity deal with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Carlos Duarte. Hello, my name is Carlos Duarte. I'm a professor of marine science at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and I will share with you what uh, COVID has meant for my research in the particular area of environment and conservation of the oceans, where I work. So the global context is that in 2020, uh, we were struggling to find a path towards a sustainable future, and uh, climate change was uh, coming towards a critical moment in the COP26 that was uh, scheduled to happen in Glasgow uh, in uh, December this year. Uh, we were addressing impacts of uh, plastic waste on the ocean through a number of bans that were regulating uh, and banning out uh, single-use plastics in many nations around the world. In 2020, we were to launch a new uh, strategy for and goals for biodiversity conservation globally. And 2020 had been termed the super year of the ocean because a, a number of processes were converging to launch a major uh, strategy to rebuild marine life in the oceans starting 2020 towards having uh, an ocean thriving with life by 2050. But all of that was disrupted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In January this year, I was in my office working with my colleague, Indy Havalan, and then he told me about this new uh, virus disease that had emerged in China, and that projections at that time, and I had hardly heard anything about it uh, at that time, but the projections indicated that as many as 40, 54 million people could be infected globally. So it seemed rather uh, dramatic, but yet from uh, my office, it seemed far away and remote. But yet uh, the COVID pandemic disrupted everything. It has had huge impacts on health and economy. All meetings and events that were to launch this strategy towards a new sustainability agenda were postponed. And uh, we now have a different agenda and a different life and a new normal that we're starting to get used to. So as of this week, uh, 8 million uh, people have been reported infected globally. Probably the true number is 10 times larger than this. So the estimate of my colleague Inti Havalan in January was actually short because we probably already existed, exceeded 50 million people infected globally. Uh, about almost half a million people have died reportedly from the disease, and probably that number is again uh, three times uh, larger. The true number is about three times larger than this number because many of the deaths have been not uh, diagnosed, and also many people have died because they haven't been able to supply uh, treatments for other diseases because all of the medical resources were focused on treating COVID uh, patients. 5% of the GDP has been lost this year, and about 1.6 billion jobs at, at risk. So this is a black swan, an unexpected surprise that has changed everything. And it has also changed how humans uh, move in the environment. So the COVID-19 pandemic also drove a wave of human confinement, starting in China on a, a early March uh, when Wuhan and other cities were uh, restricted in terms of movements and then progressing towards the West. And eventually by uh, April, about 58% uh, of the global population was confined. So uh, we have published uh, just this week this figure that combines estimates of different uh, legislation and, and decrees that were passed globally with the number of people affected to reconstruct the timeline of people moved into confinement. And by April uh, 15, there were uh, 4.6 billion people were confined, uh, staying at home, and that represents 58% of the global population. Much of that in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where global population uh, concentrates. 
So the streets were uh, empty, and that again was an unexpected development from the pandemic, that we had not envisaged that this will happen, that humans will be confined under this surprising event of the, of the COVID. And soon after the streets became empty and people were confined, then we started to see reports of unusual behavior of wildlife responding to the confinement of humans. So in New Zealand, uh, rare birds were starting to breed. We saw reports of pumas in the streets of uh, Chile and also condor in the capital of Chile. And many other reports were starting to come that uh, also affected the oceans. So uh, we heard of blue whales uh, approaching uh, shorelines, uh, whereas they usually kept uh, themselves about 100 miles offshore, they were being seen at one mile offshore. Same for sharks, basking sharks, uh, marine mammals like uh, dolphins. There were all of this news from the world of how uh, wildlife, both on land and the oceans, were starting to come out of their own confinement and use the opportunity of having humans confined to uh, uh, reclaim back their territories in busy areas and urban environments. So uh, we've seen uh, killer whales also uh, approaching the shores of uh, uh, Vancouver City, even uh, dolphins swimming up rivers in the UK and other areas. Uh, we also noticed uh, globally that the water quality was improving in coastal areas and that the atmosphere was clean and free of uh, pollutants and that the ocean and land was also going quiet. So noise levels were coming down as we were confined. And the, the impacts of this human confinement actually reached areas where there are very few humans, including the Arctic, because uh, these uh, geese uh, travel every year uh, to the Arctic, and in doing so, then they land on agricultural fields where they are considered to be pests, and they are often shot. But this time, they could feed on the agricultural fi uh, fields in uh, New England, without any restriction because they were not being chased away or killed. So by the time they arrived to the Arctic, they arrived fatter, in better condition, and in larger numbers than ever before. We also noticed a rare uh, endangered species like uh, the olive, olive Ridley uh, turtle in the Indian Ocean, then succeeding in having a mass wave of reproduction with uh, over uh, more than 3,000 females suc successfully nesting in urban beaches in India because there was uh, nobody around, whereas these beaches are usually trampled by cars and people. Fishing boats were not operating, which usually catch a lot of the turtles in their nets. And also the highway that runs next to the beach was empty, so the lights of the cars were not distracting the small turtle, turtle hatchlings into going into the road where they will be run over. In fact, we also have reports of roadkill, animals that get uh, uh, hit by cars in highway, the numbers being much less, and animals safely going across highways for the first time in, in decades. Uh, even the climate system has had a, 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 a momentum with, with COVID. And, uh, uh, both because of the emissions reductions, but also because uh, the world is looking at taking COVID as an opportunity for a reset of the economy and reset the economy in a green way that will help us meet the goals of the Paris Agreement in stabilizing the climate system. And if we look at the global emissions over time, then we can see the continuous rise of global emissions of greenhouse gases that we are familiar with with the small dips such as the global financial crisis about a decade ago, but uh, we can realize that there was a major impact of COVID on greenhouse gas emissions with a, a daily de decrease of 18% in the emission levels uh, in March and April this year. And this is unprecedented since the industrial, industrial revolution that we have had such a strong reduction in greenhouse emissions. So that actually has put us again in course to be able to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and stabilize the climate, which was very uncertain with the past trajectory. But we have an opportunity then to have a green restart and then uh, bring down emissions 
and end up in the lower part of this uh, curve. So we are projecting an 8% decline in greenhouse gas emissions uh, for 2020, and this might uh, uh, carry on forward, so we might be in a better position to uh, ad address the goals of the Paris Agreement that we were in the past. But not all news about the human confinement and the reduced human activity have been positive for wildlife and ecosystems. So with the decrease in economy and the unemployment, many people have reverted to poaching and illegal fishing to be able to acquire their food, and also uh, wardens and, uh, and guards of national parks and protected areas were also confined, so they were not able to enforce and monitor uh, the compliance. So we've seen reports of increased uh, poaching and illegal fishing around the world from Argentina, to uh, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and many, and many other areas. Uh, also, there was ongoing parallel to COVID. There was a major disruption, which was a wave of locusts that was progressing from the Arabian desert to the African horn. And uh, the, the aid and the resources that would have been deployed in this area to avoid famines were actually diverted to uh, address the COVID pandemic and therefore, uh, millions of people are at risk of famine from this uh, locust wave that just coincided with, with COVID. Uh, lockdown is also bad news as well for wildlife in some areas because human, uh, humans play also a role as custodians and stewards of the environment. So many uh, programs of uh, reintroduction of endangered species or programs of ecosystem restoration were disrupted and stopped due to uh, the lockdown. We have also seen a tsunami of plastic now washing into our shores, and this is reported globally, and it is very easy to recognize this as, as being a fingerprint of COVID because it's face masks, gloves, and other pro personal protection uh, equipment that are being discarded because it's considered dangerous. And whereas we were expecting a decrease in single-use plastic uh, demand of about 10% this year, in fact, we have seen a surge of 18% increase in single-use plastic. And that means that we need to reconsider our strategy to address plastic problems in the environment. Because without single-use plastic used for medical purpose and personal protection, the impact of COVID would have been much larger. So obviously, plastic is not the culprit. It's what we do with plastic, it's our behavior. And we need to manage our behavior and design these materials so they are uh, recycled and used again rather than end up in the environment. And with the uh, collapse of uh, uh, air transportation and some components of shipping and road traffic, the, de the demand for oil also decreased. And the price uh, of oil uh, plummeted, and in fact, it went to negative price for the first time in history. And uh, yet, the facilities were continue, continuing to pump oil, so uh, all of the storage available on land was fully used already. And then uh, the industry reverted to use super tankers to hold uh, the surplus of oil on the ocean and the volume of oil held in floating super tankers on oceans, typically around harbors such as Singapore, in the image here, multiplied by six relative to normal. And this represents a risk of oil spills increasing also in the ocean and a major threat to uh, marine life and biodiversity, whereas in the last decade, the number of oil spills, spills globally had decreased to half compared to the decade before. So now, now we are back again to a major risk of oil spills in the ocean due to COVID. So a very unintended impact of COVID on, uh, on the oceans. And also research was disrupted. Uh, here at CAOS, we haven't been able to uh, continue our field work since March. So it's been three months and we haven't been able to conduct our research, monitor our reefs, monitor our ecosystems. But the same happens globally. And a major expedition in the Arctic uh, uh, was disrupted. That was the Mosaic uh, program with a budget of about 170 million uh, euros. They were going to lock an icebreaker on the Arctic year-round 
to look at how uh, Arctic e ecosystem functions during the year, and they have to unfreeze the the uh, the icebreaker and uh, take it back to Germany in March because they couldn't resupply the crew without uh, risks of uh, contamination and infection with COVID. And there's been also impacts to the regular activities of national park, parks, conservation programs. And even though many of our instruments are uh, login devices that are able to work autonomously, still they depend on humans to download the data or maintain the instruments. So we have also learned that uh, our monitoring systems and our observing systems are fragile and they're vulnerable to disruptions such as COVID that also impact our capacity to assess the responses of the, uh, of the ecosystems and environment. So summarizing all these evidences, uh, then uh, my colleagues Amanda Bates, uh, Richard, Richard Primack, and myself, Amanda works at the Memorial University, she's a marine ecologist, uh, Richard Primark is a professor at the Boston University uh, working on conservation biology and my, myself got together to drive a major global effort to try to use the global uh, human confinement as an experiment of uh, how uh, ecosystems may respond to the, the confinement of, of humans. So we just published this week a paper in biological conservation called COVID-19 Pandemic and Associated Lockdown as a Global Human Confinement Experiment to Investigate Biodiversity Conservation. And in this paper, we lay out a roadmap and also a number of hypotheses that can be tested at a global scale, probably for the first and only time in our lifetimes, assessing the cascade of effects of, of how human mobility and activity affects biodiversity and ecosystems, also address challenges to our current understanding of processes affecting biodiversity and ecosystems, both positive and negative. And then using this uh, human confinement as a stress test of the adequacy and robustness and the power of observation systems currently in place to detect the hypothesized responses. So we have built a diagram that summarizes the hypothesis. First, how human confinement affects uh, transport, commuting of humans, uh, food transport, supply chains, and also recreational activities, and how this affect on, translate on pressures in the environment like noise, like greenhouse gases, pollution, exploitation of resources, and habitat loss, and also the different impacts of uh, this uh, a cascade of effects on the environment, both positive and negative, and also the impacts on uh, research efforts and conservation efforts. So this is a um, network that maps the series of interactions that we are now uh, investigating and quantifying through the bad environment effort. And this is a bottom-up approach that has grown organically to now involve more than 100 institutions globally and a number of global programs that have agreed to supply and contribute their observations and data to be able to have a global assessment of all of these impacts of human confinement on wildlife and ecosystems. So we have uh, research teams that are looking at freshwater environments, rivers and lakes and reservoirs, and looking at responses in these systems. We have teams that are looking at uh, marine ecosystems. Some teams are addressing both. And we also are uh, looking at global processes such as climate, air quality, land use, and other global processes. So the number of processes that we are uh, addressing with the team is quite extensive and significant. And it will provide a very comprehensive portrait of what human activity means in terms of uh, uh, wildlife and ecosystems and conservation uh, goals. So one resource that we're also using is that a global society called the Biologian Society brings together about 800 scientists around the world that are using sensors that transmit the data to satellite and they are tracking animal movement through these sensors. And this uh, figure shows the, the global map of human population density and superimposed on that, it shows the number of active satellite tracking devices. 
So there are hundreds of animals that range from birds to uh, marine mammals and large uh, mammals on land that are being tracked. And now we can use this tracking data to assess how human confinement may have affected their behavior and their movement uh, at a global scale. We're also using uh, satellite uh, programs, and in particular the Copernicus uh, uh, Earth Observing System of the EU to assess the effect of human confinement on air quality. So this shows, for instance, impacts of uh, COVID on the nitrous oxide concentration comparing March 2019 and March 2020 in Germany, Italy, and Spain in Europe, and we see a major reduction uh, of uh, nitrous oxide uh, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. And in the map, you see an image of uh, Germany and levels of nitrous oxide with the yellow levels being very high concentrations in Germany in March this year compared to on the other half of the map, we see March 2019. So you can see the dramatic reduction concentrated around urban areas where air quality uh, hugely increased and that provides also uh, a compelling evidence of the effect of uh, traffic and uh, transport systems on air quality and therefore our health. So the number of people that died annually, die annually from poor uh, air quality is actually much larger than the number of people that will die this year from COVID. So this is also an important awareness that we are not committed to poor air quality and we can change our behavior and transport systems in ways that uh, improve human health and reduce mortality driven by air pollution. We have also monitored uh, the global conversation in social media around, around nature and COVID. So on the top, we see the number of tweets in English. And uh, this is data that uh, this effort that is uh, led by, by my colleague, Professor Xianlang Sang. So she's been, uh, her team has been uh, tracking about 150 million tweets uh, during uh, the, the COVID uh, time. And then we have looked at uh, how many of those tweets are making comments about nature, wildlife, and the environment. And what we can see below is that at the beginning of COVID, the uh, conversation in uh, Twitter that was addressing issues of the environment was about uh, 10%, and this has doubled during COVID. So as humans have been confined, then humans have longed to be able to experience nature and be outdoors and uh, they were willing and uh, missing the opportunity to experience uh, our oceans and our forests and land. There's also been a lot of discussion in Twitter on the link between pandemia and biodiversity conservation through the steps that link uh, bats with other animals like pangolin and human and how a better conservation of forests and ecosystems might also help us protect our, ourselves and being less vulnerable to pandemics. And there's also been a lot of discussion about unusual uh, sightings and behaviors of wildlife uh, around the world in this Twitter conversation. And also a lot of interest on the need for a green and a blue start of the economy. So we do things better when we go on into a new uh, normal. Uh, we uh, touched upon how uh, traffic on land has decreased, improving air quality, but we have seen the same in the ocean. And if we look at the area in Venice, in uh, Italy, this is a paper just published this week that shows a major reduction in fishing vessel activity uh, around Venice. Uh, this is the number of miles traveled by different types of vessels, and also a collapse of passenger traffic around, around uh, Venice. And these data are retrieved from the auto automatized identification system, which is a satellite, satellite tracking device, similar to that that we put on animals and whales, but that the vessels carry themselves, reporting their position every second, uh, every second minute. So we can actually track fishing activity, we can track uh, cargo, we, we are incorporating all of that into pan environment as well. And along with a reduction of uh, of uh, traffic in the ocean and shipping activity, then it comes a reduction in noise. So this is, for instance, also a paper published this week uh, from uh, 
uh, Vancouver, where uh, there's been a decrease in submarine noise due to the decrease in ship traffic, and in this case, particularly uh, from passenger uh, boats. And then that has attracted orcas to be seen in the urban areas of Vancouver, where they had never seen before in the last decades. I, I mentioned that uh, in the confinement, much of the conversation was about humans uh, missing the interaction with nature. And using uh, data from Google, we can calculate how COVID and the confinement impacted on the visits to national parks. So this is a global map downloaded from a, from a Google uh, mobility program where uh, we have calculated the uh, impact of COVID on the visits to parks. So in many areas of the world, it's been 100% shutdown of visitors. And in some areas, it's been 30, 40, 60%. And this may be good for the environment because uh, there's less disturbance from human presence on wildlife. But on the other hand, many of these protected areas depend on the revenues of the entrance fees that visitors pay to be able to maintain their conservation programs. So uh, we, we also are learning that perhaps the way we visit national parks can be improved. So we can be less disruptive in our visits and we can come back to visit national parks while also allowing uh, wildlife to enjoy uh, quiet environments. So all in all, in pan environment, in this effort that has grown rapidly in the past two months, we uh, are seeing that as humans went into confinement, nature went quieter and also cleaner in terms of uh, water quality and air quality, and that released wildlife from their own force confinement. And we have now experienced confinement ourselves, and we've seen how painful it is psychologically and emotionally for us to be locked at home, being unable to interact with others and enjoy nature and even exercise. We are now more empathic to wildlife, which is confined in increasingly smaller parcels of nature because of our prevalent pressure in the ecosystems. And I think now that we understand the pain of confinement better ourselves, we might find ways to better share the planet with wildlife so that we are quieter in the way we uh, are present in the environment and then we're more aware of how our present uh, means in terms of uh, behaviors uh, of wildlife. Uh, the economic impacts of COVID, which are uh, yet certainly not over, and they're actually growing, are creating increasing pressures on, on wildlife because of increasing pressure for illegal uh, fishing and poaching that we need to monitor, and then we need to alleviate those in need so they don't need to revert to uh, poaching and illegal fishing to be able to meet their livelihoods. Uh, we also are learning that humans also play an important role as custodians of the environment. And as we are confined, the many programs that are important for conservation are discontinued. Um, this might undo efforts of uh, decades trying to conserve individual species. So it's important that we, moving forward, are able to use new technologies to uh, be able to continue our work in the environment and monitoring of the environment without necessarily being present there. So we need to enhance our capacity for ro robotized and remote systems to be able to uh, observe, monitor, and take care of the, of the environment. And all in all, we're adding our own component to our thoughts on how the recovery from COVID should be globally, where much of the discussion is that the recovery should be green. But to this, we will add that it should be also blue, and it should be equitable, so uh, people in need do not need to reverse to poaching and illegal fishing to be able to feed themselves. And that also we uh, consider uh, the ethics of our impacts on wildlife and we're also equitable in sharing the planet with other species. Thank you. <laughs>